can start limiting the witness to two to three minutes. And if you can say what you've got to say in two or three minutes, that's great. If somebody else has already said what you'd like to say, uh, then you can just say amen, uh, and we will do it that way. So the chair at this time will call Stuart McMullen. I think we have a couple of videos to play before we get started. Uh, my name is Stuart how, how McMullen. Long are they? They're two minutes each. One was supposed to play for Andrews, and one was supposed to play for mine. Can we just pass on them, and you go ahead and testify, sir? I can do that. My name is Stuart McMullen. All right. I am uh, for the bill, and I'm here on behalf of the Fathers' Rights Movement of Texas, Fixed Family Courts, myself, and my son, Sterling. And I've got my testimony written out for y'all to read. And then I'd also like to hand out a, a handout so that you can see, have a visual representation of how the actual current okay, if you'll visitation just it to is. that young lady, she'll make sure we get it. <clears throat> and while you're waiting for that, here's a picture of my son and I taken recently, okay. just to bring it close to your heart, like he is to mine. You can go ahead and proceed, Mr. Member. Okay. Okay, please. I'd like to thank Representative Pena, uh, his staff, Marcella and Michael, for bringing this bill to the committee and also to, to Moria Jones for her assistance. I'm here because I am a victim of the family court system. My son is also a victim of the family court system. It is broken and it needs to be fixed. Although House Bill 2363 is not perfect and does not fit all of the problems with the family courts, it is a huge step in the right direction. Therefore, I'm asking that you support this bill and pass this bill. Assuming that both parents are fit and loving, I believe that a child should be with both parents equally. Not only is this, not only is this a logical approach, but Mr. Sanford, this is a theological approach as well, and that it's a God-given right for a child to have both parents equally, and that both parents have equal access to their child. If you think about it, Ms. Riddle, Representative Riddle, I live a few, mi few miles from Sterling School. I'm self-employed. I set my own schedule. I work around my possession schedule. I'm the homeroom dad. I'm a watchdog. I volunteer at the school. I coach his sports. I'm an active participant in his life. I take him to the doctor. I take him to the dentist. I take him to get haircuts. I pay for the extracurricular activities. I provide food, clothing, and shelter for him. <coughs> Why should I be denied the right to have possession of my child at least half the time? Why should anyone else in my situation be denied that right? We shouldn't be, but the system is broken and it needs to be fixed. Some of the opponents of this bill will argue that it's all about not having to pay child support. I would say that they're wrong, but it is part of the problem. I would also say that the child support system is broken and it <coughs> needs to be fixed as well. If I'm willing to have possession of my son at least half of his life, why should I pay someone else to do what I'm willing to do myself? So again, excuse me, he has his own room at his house, his own clothes, his own toys, his own food. He uses water, glass, and electricity. I have all of these expenses even when he's not with me. So again, I ask, why should I pay someone else to take care of Sterling when I'm able and willing to do it myself? Why is the state forcing their opinion on me of what is the best for Sterling? This system is intruding into my son's life denying him equal access to both parents, and I have to pay his mother to do something I can do for him myself. This is wrong and needs to change. Dr. Richard Warshak, who is an expert on this, uh, from the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center, states in his article, Social Science and Parenting Plans for Young Children, a consensus report. Shared, and I quote, shared parenting should be the norm for children of all ages 
including very young children. Mr. McMullen, can you kind of conclude and wrap it up for us? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, Ms. Riddle, Representative Riddle, you mentioned last week that children are used as pawns and used in tug of war. <clears throat> I was only allowed to talk to my son eight times in the past year because the final decree did not specifically state that we allow phone access. The cops were called on me for being at my son's school on days that I did not have possession. I was being alienated from my son and he was being alienated from me. All of this is not good for the child, but if both parents have equal access, there would be less chance of parental alienation. There's some statistics here that Representative Pena went through. And finally, I'm going to flip to the last page just to speed things along. Second to left, last paragraph. Texas needs to be a leader for equal, equal rights, and Texans need you to support this bill, encourage this bill, and pass this bill. On March 25th in this room, Steve Bresnan from the Family Law Foundation testified on House Bill 1195 by Representative Bohack. Mr. Bresnan opposed the bill because, as he said... Well, Mr. McMullen, let me stop you there. We can't talk about another bill because that bill's not before us, okay? Okay. We only talk Strike about that. the bills that are here, and the reason for that is you will subject the bill to a point of order if I allow you to do that, and so we'll have to strike that testimony. Strike that. Okay, thank It's you. not what he said other than if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Okay. Well, I'm here to tell you that the system is broke and we do need to fix it. He also said get the state out of the way and I couldn't agree with him more because the state does need to get out of the way and let all fit and loving parents have equal access to their children. We do not need the state to determine what is in the best interest of our children. As a fit and loving parent, it is assumed that I know the best interest of my child, Thank not the state. Thank you, Mr. McMullen. Any question for Mr. McMullen, members? Mr. McMullen, thank you for being here and thank you for your testimony. Thank Chair you. calls thank Rustin you. Wright testifying for House Bill 2363 with the Father's Right Movement of Texas. My name is Rustin Wright and I'm testifying for the bill. I'm here on behalf of myself, my 10 year old son, Aiden Wright and the Father's Rights Movement of Texas. First, I'd like to give you a summary of how this bill could have helped me and my son avoid 10 years of litigation, spending over $100,000 with no end in sight. The first year of my son's life, I was only allowed to see him once for about an hour. His mother sued me for paternity, so we had a DNA test. The results came back 99.999% positive he was mine. I got lucky with the first judge, who rendered the first order. The judge coincidentally never knew his father and believed that fathers should be in their children's lives. He awarded 50-50 possession in my case. The judge was elderly and soon retiring. My son's mother knew this and told me as soon as he retired, she was going to sue me again to take away 50-50 custody and reduce my son and I's time together as much as possible. After a couple of years of grueling litigation, we settled on the courthouse steps. I gave in to my son's mother out of fear that I would lose even more parenting time. I settled for first, third, and fifth weekends, 50 days of the summer, an additional weekend per quarter that, unfortunately, was routinely denied. Two out of three spring breaks, and we alternated holidays. I was led to believe this was a better deal than what the judge would decide. This order was supposed to be locked in until my son turned 10 years old. This turned out to not be true because she sued me two more times before our son turned 10. House Bill 2363 by Representative Pena would have given me an opportunity of equal parenting and leveled the playing field with my son's mother. I wouldn't have given in to such a limited amount of time if I knew the court was required to give me equal or closer to equal time. I talk to a lot of parents now and 99% of the parents tell me they are giving in and agreeing to the standard or extended standard because of fear of getting less time with their children. They are also unable to afford the legal costs associated with ongoing family law litigation. Under current law, these parents are unable to pay to play. 
In addition to repeatedly suing me to reduce our time together, my son's mother filed for and was granted a permanent injunction against me taking our son to his favorite extracurricular activity of martial arts. It was a father-son bonding activity that we can no longer participate in. It was our play group. We were part of a family there. I've had three different judges that have had three different views of what is in my son's best interest in the past 10 years. As I stated earlier, the first judge gave me 50-50. The second judge was admittedly biased and was going to take more time away from my son and I. And now I'm on my third judge and again under threat of losing even more time with my son. In each lawsuit since the first case, I've lost more time with my son throughout the whole litigation process. Now with the new and third judge, I have no idea whether or not I'm going to be able to continue to pay to play. So I might lose my son because of the costs associated with the litigation process. His mother knows that all she has to do is to continue suing me, driving up costs and depleting my funds. I've already maxed out $50,000 of credit cards, spent my entire retirement and savings, and I have no other assets to tap into. She will not stop until she takes my son and I away from each other. She will continue to do this as long as she believes the courts will allow it, and my son will have lost his father. Something the first judge tried to prevent. Something the courts should be preventing. The bottom line is I support this bill. I'm requesting that the best interest part define proper due process triggers before the judge uses it to take away any fit and loving parents equal time. Do you guys have any questions? Okay, any me? questions of Mr. Wright members? Mr. Wright, there are no questions, so thank you very much for being here. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for that picture. Did you, uh, we have Stuart McMullen. Hello, my name is Stuart McMullen. I'm with Americans for Parental Equality. Um, I'm testifying for Senate Bill 816. Uh, we're talking a lot about Troxel v. Granville, and it was just pointed out that this uh, ruling did four major things. One was that it uh, set the following precedents, that parents are presumed to be fit. Parents are presumed to act in the best interest of the child. Parents can only be found unfit with clear and convincing evidence, and that the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment protects the fundamental right of parents to make decisions concerning the care custody and control of their children. In my testimony, I've listed out several Supreme Court cases over the past hundred years that set that president and back it up. Uh, in this proposed Bill 816, um, I do recommend a couple of changes and they're, they're lined, uh, outlined in this testimony that I've handed out to you. Um, in the temporary order section, it should be changed to read that the court orders equal possession, equal access, and equal rights to both fit parents, or the order is an agreement between parents who are fit parents. In the same section, uh, in, the, in the, the same changes in the final order section should be the court orders equal possession, equal access, and equal rights to both fit parents, or the order is an agreement between parents who are both fit. Um, the current Texas Family Code is unconstitutional, and this is why the state routinely infringes upon the fundamental right of parents to make decisions concerning the care, custody, and control of their children without first alleging them to be unfit and then also finding them to be unfit with clear and convincing evidence. Instead, the state uses the judge to determine the best interest of the child with a preponderance of evidence both which violate the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. Senate Bill 816, with these suggested changes, will bring constitutional clarity to the Family Code. It will put parents' rights above states' rights, and it will also offer proper due process to all fit parents. Any questions? No? Okay, thank you, Mr. Okay, and at this time, the chair calls Stuart McMullen. Okay, and please state your name and whom you represent and if you are on for or against HB 
My name is Stuart McMullen. I'm with Americans for Parental Equality, and I'm testifying against 3085. I removed my case to federal court in June of 2016 after my 37th appearance in family court. As I stated in my removal, the purpose was not to modify custody, and it was not to reduce child support. The purpose of the removal was to challenge the constitutionality of the state statutes in the Texas Family Code. The Judiciary Act of 1789 provided for cases to enter into a federal court the removal of a case originally filed in a state court. This was reaffirmed by the Civil Rights Act of 1866. It provides a federal civil rights removal statute that reads, any of the following civil actions or criminal prosecutions commenced in a state court may be removed by the defendant to the District Court of the United States for the district and division embracing the place wherein it is pending against any person any person who is denied or cannot enforce in the courts of such state a right under any law providing for the equal civil rights of citizens of the United States or of all persons within this jurisdiction. This statute was designed to counteract the Black Codes or the Jim Crow laws which were enacted in the southern states during Reconstruction. The statutes in the Texas Family Code are the modern day Jim Crow laws. They systemically and blatantly <coughs> violate our due process rights guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. So naturally, a 1443 removal to federal court is justified. And I'll read a short section from my removal. The state of Texas must first surpass pre-deprivation serious parental unfitness due process hurdles, and that by clear and convincing evidence, before it may then and only then remove the custodial rights of any parent to his or her own <laughs> natural child. There is no standard review applicable here. It is simply a matter of fact examination of whether the United States Supreme Court has ruled that states must perform certain federal okay. due process Sir. procedures. Sorry. Can you I'll wrap it up. My case is not unique. The state of Texas family court system is wildly unconstitutional, even massively so with perpetrating routine daily frauds upon the basic constitutional and due process rights of approximately <coughs> one half of all natural parents involved within domestic relation cases over okay. child custody Sir. between two competing Sir. parents. <clears throat> Mr. McMullen, so we have, to, we have okay. to keep going. Sorry, we've got a lot of In closing, if our laws were constitutional and we were given proper due process in family courts, our need okay. to remove our Mr. cases McMullen, to the federal I'm sorry, court we have to, we have to keep would going. not exist. All right, members, are there any questions? Okay. At this time, the chair calls Jeffrey Younger. And please state your name and who you represent and if you're on for or against HB 3085. My name is Jeff Younger. I represent me, myself, and I, just a Texan. And I am against it. And I managed to actually register correctly for this one. Um, the reason I'm against it is I'm currently under unconstitutional temporary orders. My, name, my son, James, um, is said by my ex-wife to be a girl. She's registered in school as a girl, sends him to school in a dress, puts him in the girl's restroom. He's about to turn seven at age eight. He's up for chemical castration, uh, suppression of uh, puberty, okay? So and my temporary orders say that I am not allowed to try to convince my son that he's a boy. Now that's a prior restraint on parental speech and that's unconstitutional. And I should have a remedy in federal court and no judge in the state of Texas should be able to punish me for that. I'm not allowed to uh, even present my son as I wish. I can't even cut his hair. I have to get court permission to cut his hair. But think about that prior restraint on speech. I'm not allowed to teach my son traditional Christian teachings on sexuality and gender. I can't let him go to Sunday school. I, I fully intend to, tr to challenge that in federal court when the t proper time comes in my case. And I don't think any judge in Texas should be able to punish me for that. Further, the real question here, and it's a, it's a real problem. What you're saying is a real problem, and I'm not, I'm not denying it, and I think we should address it. I just think that it should be addressed by the federal court, which is a competent authority to determine if it's a frivolous removal. And if it's a frivolous removal, the federal court can do all the things you wish. And in fact, they already do. Federal courts are known for being pretty draconian for frivolous actions. So I think it's a superfluous uh, bill, and, and I, I urge you not to send it for a vote. Okay, thank you, members. Are there any questions? No? All right, thank you. Chair lays out bill uh, 18, excuse me, 2157 by Representative Middleton. Do you want me to go ahead and 
Oh, no, 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 no. Middleton was 2157. Yeah, I'd pass it to 2157, correct? Did I give you a yes. new number? <laughs> yes. I just want to see if you're on your toes, freshman. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Uh, today, I'm, or tonight, rather, I'm laying out House Bill 2157. Um, this bill was brought to me by constituents in my district who want something very simple, and that is when parents walk into a courtroom, that there be a presumption of equal custody until or unless facts prove that that would be against the best interest of the child. My bill encourages judges to order parents to share equally in the rights and duties of raising their children and to give children equal access to both their parents. Specifically, House Bill 2157 amends the Family Code to stipulate that the public policy of the state is the equal parenting order unless the judge determines facts indicate otherwise then it defaults to the standard possession order or some other order as the judge deems appropriate. The bottom line is we encourage judicial discretion and possession orders for the best interest of the child. <clears throat> Additionally, House Bill 2157 adds that when an equal parenting order is granted, that there be not more than five days more possession granted to one parent annually, and then the next year the other parent shall have possession of the child that many days more, so however many days that is. This bill encourages that qualified loving parents get equal access to their children, and even more importantly, that children get equal access to their parents if the judge determines that to be in the best interest of the child. Finally, the parents may still agree to any other possession agreement that they both approve. With that, I yield for questions and reserve the right to close. Okay, questions of Representative Middleton. If not, we're going to reserve your right to close. At this time, we'll call Chairman Stan Sanford for HB 3414. Chairman. Thank you, Chair and Committee uh, members. Um, 3414 uh, just uh, is similar, of course, to the bills you're hearing right now. Current law provides only two uh, standard possession orders. Uh, options uh, for parents and their children following a divorce. Uh, a standard possession order which allows children 23 to 24 percent time with a non-custodial parent and an expanded standard, standard possession order which is subject to the judge's discretion and allows children 33 to 34 percent with their non-custodial uh, parent. House Bill 3414 would provide a third option an equal possession time election option that would allow children to have equal time with each parent subject to a judge's discretion. This bill would not mandate in any way that this parenting plan be used. It merely puts it in code as an option. HB 3414 allows parents and judges more options when selecting parenting plans and updates Texas Family Code to include another option in deciding the possession order that is best for the child. Additionally, this bill does not mandate or presume that equal possession orders will be applied, nor does it require judges to obey a parent's election. Such an election is still subject to the best interest of the child standard. This bill seeks to provide families with more freedom and independence to work uh, to figure out a plan that works best for the children when such a situation is possible. Okay, questions? Okay. Reserve we'll reserve your right to close. Uh, my name is Laura Alter. I'm representing right. myself as a mom of eight okay. children. Um, and I'm for each of these bills. Okay, thank um, you. Certainly an intent. Um, let me keep this to, to two minutes. I, I certainly appreciate it. So, 3414 is sort of a bottom-up approach without litigation that willing and able parents would be able to elect what essentially amounts to adding one additional day to what's currently available in the election. So right now, um, parents can elect um, an overnight on Thursday and school out to school in Friday to Monday morning. If you added the election for Wednesday night, that would be a 225 schedule, which would give children equal time with both of their parents. Um, so the delta to p between where the law is now and what this would allow is one day per week that they would spend um, in addition. So it's, it's really small. I want to make sure it's clear how tiny the change is, but the value add for kids is really big. Um, uh, let's see. 1807, I really appreciate um, increasing the exposure for the available elections. I think most non-custodial, non-primary parents aren't aware that there are elections available. Um, so the increased visibility I'm definitely in favor of in the code. Um, and then HB 2157, um, as it is uh, right now, um, when parents 
if, if one parent does not agree, 90% of primary parents look like me, they're moms. Um, this means that if the presumed non-primary parent, which is probably dad, if the mom doesn't agree to let dad stay an active parent in a child's life, um, the law says that that's how it should be. That's the presumption. So if they can't get the agreement from mom, they have to go to court, which is expensive, traumatic for kids, and it's totally unnecessary. So this bill would say kids need both parents. As the state, our law is going to be to preserve the child's access to their parents if their parents decide to live apart. And then let's adjust for the children who are in the home based on the actual situation so they can have the best life possible. Um, I absolutely fully support that. I think there's a lot of ways to make that happen. I really appreciate the intent of each of these bills um, because I think no matter what parents, what decision parents make about their personal relationship status, those children need the state of Texas to protect their right to access their parents. Thank you, ma'am. Good job. Thank you. Any questions? Thank okay. you. Thank you so much. Um, next witness is Michael Clifton. Mr. Clifton, tell us your name, who you represent, and your position on HB 1807 and HB 2157. Thank you, Chairman. My name is Michael Clifton. I rise in support of all of these proposals. Excuse me, also HB 3414. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, again, to reiterate, I rise in support of all of these proposals. Um, I'm also a um, children and parental rights advocate here in Texas. Um, <laughs> There's four respective tabs in there. I'd like to address your attention to each one on this. Um, we as parents here today uh, and advocates, we've requested a multitude of interactions with this committee over years, falling on deaf ears. It is incumbent upon you, this body, to gather input from all involved. I think one of the other representatives stated there's subtle differences here. So maybe perhaps to alleviate those subtle differences, um, and this committee not to arbitrarily dismiss a complete category of parents, uh, perhaps because of the actions of a single person or because they don't have the title of attorney behind their name or because of the name of their organization. We, again, as parents, would gladly aid this committee in an interim study or an advisory committee consisting of parental involvement. Tab two, please. Um, our opponents to the shared parenting bills, uh, they have an overt pecuniary interest uh, to changes in family-related laws, specifically the Family Law Foundation is who I'm going to name, and in order to maintain the current status quo, which is a multi-billion dollar industry. Let me repeat that, B as in billion. Tab three, the willful and false stereotyping of parents, us parents specifically, uh, advocating for change, for merely attempting to address a myriad of problems that we're hearing about within the family court structure and annotated by these legislative proposals and the systemic deficiencies, not the least of which is equal access to our children. As you see in tab three, there's an overt gender discrimination and preconceived bias by the very witness that this committee relies upon for input. Uh, my opinion is you as a committee can do better than this. Just ask us. I guarantee I can fill this room with professional and credential persons who, ha who happen to be parents and truly have the best interest of our future at heart, our children, in contrast with an entity self-serving and in an entrenched pecuniary interest. With that, I'll close. Optics are important when stereotyping. I'll let the last photo speak for itself, and I thank you. Again, I support all of these proposals. Mr. Clifton, we sure appreciate your testimony. Thank you, thank Chairman. Thank you, sir. Any questions for Mr. Clifton? Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay, next, David O'Connor. Please state your name, who you represent, and your position on HB 2157, HB 3414. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the members of this committee for allowing me to testify. <clears throat> My name is Dr. David O'Connor. I'm a, a child and adolescent psychiatrist with over 23 years of practice experience in a variety of settings, including juvenile justice. Um, I'm considered an expert in the field of child development, child health, child emotional and psychological health, as well as child psychopathology. 
I support 2157 and 3414 as they offer the potential of equalized parenting for our children of divorce and can help eliminate the discrimination that's incurred upon this subpopulation of Texas children compared to children in married situations. As you may know, the Texas SPO, or Standard Possession Order, and Expanded Standard Possession Order relegate that a child is able to see the non-custodial parent approximately 25 to 35% of the time, respectively. In the child development field, the experts in this field um, consider that less than 35% of non-custodial child time and parent time is actually considered sole custody. So Texas logically really has a sole custody situation. Um, there is a consensus of child developmental experts. Just to name a few, Linda Nielsen at Wake Forest, Edward Cruck in uh, British Columbia, Richard Warshak up in Southwestern, Bill Fabricius in Arizona, agree that maximizing child parent time insulates the child from parental conflict, decreases parental conflict and litigation, promotes the child's perception that both parents are equal and valuable, and shields the child from the issue of what's called parental alienation. As stated in Richard Warshak's 2016 and 17 International Consensus Review, 110 child development experts support that shared parenting and overnight for young children basically notably gives better outcomes compared to sole custody situations. Dr. Linda Nielsen from Wake Forest has a 2018 published 60 study review and stated that with exception of domestic violence or direct harm to the child, parental conflict is not the most important factor for child well-being. The most important factor is the quantity and quality of the parent-child relationship. She also stated that there is a deceptive message that's been propagated for decades, that parent conflict is the main influencing factor of child outcomes, which it is not. The main Doctor, um, I think we, we get the message. Okay. We've been very thorough. If we there are any questions, thank you any, so much. Any questions for Dr. Conner? I do. Yes, sir. Ms. Kalani. I, I do. Yes. yes thanks. What, what is the main, because the main, you said that, that, that it's not the, the parent conflict. You said the main thing. What, oh, what the is main it? thing that uh, for child well-being is the parent-child relationship. Okay. Uh, conflict is, of course, con it's ideal that parents have a harmonious relationship, but even in marital situations, that's not always achieved. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you, Doc. Yes, sir. Okay. Chair calls Gabrielle Conanejo. And if you would, uh, tell us your name, who you represent, your positions on HB 2157, HB 3414. Uh, my name is Gabriel Cornell. I'm here in support. Okay. Both bills. I, uh, who do you represent? Myself. Yourself? Good. Okay. Myself. I don't have a call. I mean, I don't have a degree. No problem. Anything. We're I glad just, you're here. Is here to speak in behalf because uh, I got thrown into the family law system by mistake, by a lie that was supported by a bunch of more lies, and I wanted to understand what was going on. So as unfair as it was for me, I went in there looking for an answer to my problems, yet I adopted a bunch of people's problems because I started seeing the injustices of the family system, how people are losing their family structure, how people are losing their children with, with, with no due process whatsoever. I don't think it's right. I don't think it's just just. Uh, it takes common sense. Common sense is something we don't learn in college. We learn from our parents and self. We look in the morning in the mirror and we know what's right and what's wrong. And there's no, no interest to any child to lose a parent at all. I don't care how you word it, you know. Uh, I can tell you what, I had a three year battle and lost a lot of money and time in my life. And my child didn't benefit from it, so it was not in their interest and I have three of them. The child in question didn't benefit a penny from it. and. No, no, nothing came out of that. But I'll tell you who did benefit, my attorney did. We benefited a lot. <laughs> so, you know, money that I could have used for my kids' call, I just went to attorney. So it makes me really sick when I hear people talk about how much they love and care about children, yet they're the one benefiting with the money that should be going to the children's education is going to them. It's disgusting to me. So I just hope that we have enough common sense to understand, you know, what a relationship is and how important a father as a mother figure is for a child. And we stop putting prices on legal procedures simply to benefit out of it. You know, we're better than that as people, and we're better than that as society. Children don't benefit from becoming uh, dropout rates, uh, incarceration rates, and you name it, drug use, gang use. All these children that come from single parent homes are the highest percentages out there on this. It's about time we stop arguing amongst each other as adults and see what's really right for those children and is to have both parents in their lives. 
Okay. Thank you, sir. We appreciate your testimony. Next chair calls Carlos Flores. <clears throat> sir, please tell us your name, who you represent, and your position on HB 2157, HB 3414. Uh, my name is Carlos Flores, and I'm representing myself. Okay. So uh, I just want to. In um, your position on. Uh, HB 2157 I'm in, in 34. Definitely 40. in favor. Of okay. It. Thumbs up. Okay. There you go. Go for it. All right. Uh, so uh, this is, I've also been uh, put into the system. I think there's been a lot of uh, mm -hmm. uh, testimony today on uh, how individuals like myself kind of get thrown into the system or, or forced into the system versus just letting us choose. I think uh, everyone here has been able to choose whether or not they want to be here. They have, nobody's been forced. But we were forced into this situation. So, uh, and unfortunately, unfortunately for me, uh, you know, I lost time that I was never able to get back uh, with my daughters, uh, Viviana Flores and Marlo Flores. <laughs> so, um, uh, quite a few times, I think that, that the Texas Family Law Foundation have said that parents already have 50-50 custody. Then why, why don't I have it? Why don't other fathers have it, uh, mothers? Uh, we know that the 42 U.S.C. 658 incentivizes states when they issue those child support orders and collect a lot of money. So uh, where does that money go? You know, it goes to uh, all across the board. Um, so uh, why am I here again today? Well, um, obviously, uh, for the past three sessions, again, the Texas Family Law Foundation has, has appeared before you guys and have stated that parents already have that 50-50 custody. So... Uh, you know, would you be in agreement with that, that parents already have 50-50 custody or or not? You know, I, I definitely would like to throw that back at, at you guys. I don't know I don't have it. I know a lot of people out here don't have it. But if they're claiming that they do, and that everybody else does, why don't we have it? So that's why I'm here. Well, thank you. We appreciate you being here. Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Flores? Please. Questions. questions don't 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 count us out just yet okay yes, representative Byers thank you chairman um, and thank you for throwing the question back at us and I don't believe that parents have 50 50 time and I just want to say you know in, in class in the classroom with children and asking for their homework you know it was as a teacher at the time it was hard to hear that they're at one parent's house this night, then they flip back over to you know their dads and their moms. They're probably not going to get back to dads for a while, so they left the homework, and it was it was really terrible. So, I thank you for throwing the question back at us because I I know that the parents don't, um, and I know I should be just talking to you, but to the others that that have testified as well, we we get it and we hear you. So thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Somebody else. Ms. Flores, thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank Appreciate you. it. Okay. Uh, David Bello. If you would, give us your name, who you represent, and your position on uh, HB 2157, HB 3414. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for allowing me to be here. I'm David Bello, and I represent myself, and I am for 2157, Equal Parenting. Five years ago, uh, my then wife uh, was leaving my one-year-old. Excuse me, uh, and also yes. you also registered under HB thirty-four. Yes, where you are uh, for that as well. Okay, yes. okay, continue. Um, my then wife, five years ago, was leaving my one-year-old son in cars and parking lots uh, while she had affairs. We got a divorce, custody proceedings. I offered fifty-fifty instead of going to get full custody because there was uh, abuse and neglect on her part. But I knew my son needed to see both our parents, and I figured with 50-50, I see him enough that I can make sure that he's being taken care of and he's old enough to talk. Well, not 30 days after we settled 50-50, because she took the deal. Um, not 30 days after she took 50-50, um, she went to a different county where she'd been living for six months, filed for a modification, um, and this judge hands out the standard possession temporarily, and that modification's been going on for three years. And the judge just, okay, even though y'all agreed to 50-50, you know, during temporarily, you'll just get standard. So my son, who's now six, 
went from me being there every single day or whenever we had 50-50, it was every couple days, um, to, uh, to going to, um, to a um, standard possession. And he's very traumatized. He's very uh, hurt. Um, he's got a lot of emotional issues. He went from a very loving child to, um, to a, a lot of uh, uh, emotional issues because now he's not able to, to see me, his father, as much. And um, I, I want you to, uh, to see um, this is my son at a drop-off. Okay, uh, Mr. Della, we appreciate your testimony. Thank you. He just wants to see his daddy. That's all he wants to do. We understand. Thank you, sir. Okay, Taran Champagne. Champagne. Cham- now, like you, drink, you do know sir. I'm from Louisiana. That's just champagne. like the drink, sir. That's Champagne in Louisiana. <laughs> Thank you very you got, much. You got the kin folks over there, but. Okay, so tell us your name, uh, who you represent in your position on HB 2157 and 3414. Thank you very much, Chairman. My name is Taryn Champagne, and I represent Americans for Parental Equality, myself and my son, Finley, and I am emphatically for these bills. Okay. As per the Texas Family Code, Section 153.002, Best Interest of the Child, the best interest of the child shall always be the primary consideration of the court in determining issues of conservatorship and possession of and access to the child. As it stands right now, what goes on in the generality of court cases where there are two fit, willing, and able parents do not in any ways reflect this lofty ideal. One of their parents, which is one of their most significant relationships, is now reduced to a guest in their life. This in turn sows seeds that bear rotten fruit. For those children stripped of their other parent, in generality their father, we see significant increases in drug and alcohol abuse, risky sexual behavior, and higher rates of incarceration. This is in part due to the standard possession order as it is. However, on a more positive note, the federal government noted in their publication the importance of fathers in the healthy development of children, highly involved biological fathers with children were 43% more likely than other children to earn mostly A's and 33% less likely than other children to repeat a grade. And even from birth, children who have an involved father are more likely to be emotionally secure, be confident to explore their surroundings, and as they grow older, have better social connections with their peers. If it is truly the policy of the state to consider the best interest of the child, why do they push one parent away from the child instead of trying to maximize the time with both parents? This can only serve to help them. The judges rely on the family code to guide them, and currently the standard possession order is what they believe to be the solution that flies in the face of countless amounts of research. In the words of Judge James Arth of Travis County, the family code, and this is a direct quote, the family code doesn't think that 50-50 time sharing is a good idea. Finally, let us not forget the human element here. Children love their parents, and the court system to rely on an outdated schedule that pushes one parent away is truly cruel. Cruel. I will close with a statement from my five-year-old son whose wisdom and grasp on this situation far outstrips his years. My friend asked them why I was coming down here, and if he understood, he said, it's to see me more often. They asked him what he thought, and this is how my son responded. He said, I do not want more time with my dad. I want equal time with him. Ms. Thank Champagne, you. We appreciate it. Any questions, Ms. Champagne? And members? I have a copy of my testimony with uh, citations. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, Jeffrey Younger. And for the record, Mr. Younger, your name, who you represent, and your position on HB 2157, HB 3414. Jeff Younger, representing myself, uh, and I am in favor of both of them. I'm not going to belabor a lot of the details. You've already heard a lot. There are some things that you two missed. I'll tell you that I'm the father of a child named James. I have twin boys, James and Jude. My ex-wife says that James is actually a transgender girl. He's uh, just about to be seven in one year. He's enrolled at the Genesis Clinic in uh, Dallas, Texas, which does sex change operations on children as early as 15. Uh, As early as eight, they can begin hormone suppression of puberty, which uses a chemical castration drug, uh, which will uh, stunt the growth of my son's sexual organs. 
So that's where I am with the court system, and I'm fighting that. She's just filed a motion to modify, which is a thinly veiled attempt to terminate my parental rights because I will not affirm that he's a girl, mainly because he only presents as a girl with his mother, and he always presents as a boy to me. So that's the background that I'm coming to this with. So, look, we all know equal access to parents is a good idea. We've had an expert testify here. We've, we've heard te you've heard testimony for years about this. We all know that. The question is, why isn't it happening? Where's that Mr. Brennan at? Is that Mr. Brennan? He's still back there, the one that went on the ramp back there. They represent a huge moneyed interest that doesn't want, that doesn't want parents to resolve their disputes with minimal litigation. They want to maximize litigation. That's one problem. The second problem, though, are actual statutes in the Texas Family Code which uh, don't give courts clear guidance on what the best interest of a child is. The first is 153.252, which absurdly presumes that 27% of the time with your child is in the best interest of the child. We had an expert, while well, you were gone, we had an expert uh, testify to this committee that that's essentially single parent, that's a single parent household because the parent doesn't exercise enough time with the child for it to be a dual parent uh, situation. So, but our, our law actually presumes that that is in the best interest of the child, and we know that's absurd. The second one, and nobody's going to talk about this, but I will, 201.107, which is the Title IV defunding, which comes into this state, the federal matching funds, which were put in place by Jimmy Carter. It's been there a long time, and it's a little over half a billion dollars. It mainly funds the Texas Attorney General's Office and judicial retirements. There's a conflict of interest with our judges, ladies and gentlemen. Right? There's, a, there's a fiduciary interest of the judges, and we need to overcome that. So we all know it's the right thing to do. We all know that there are, where's that Mr. Brennan? Rich moneyed interests who are trying to split families up from their parents. And we know that there's a massive agencies in the Texas government that don't want to lose this money. I'm asking you mm -hmm. to pass these bills and don't take money. Yeah, excuse me, Mr. Younger. Um, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. And just mm -hmm. for the record, you need to stay focused on the bill, okay? Yes. Thank you for being here. Okay, Joshua Jaros. And please tell us your name, your position, uh, or excuse me, who you represent and your position on the bills. It looks like 1807, 2157, and 3414. Uh, thank you, committee members, for giving us this opportunity to come speak to you this evening. Um, my name is Joshua Jairus, and I do support uh, all of these bills. Um, I will say this, uh, um, and I, I am representing Montgomery County United for Shared Parenting. Um, the only bill that does not remove children from a single parent home is Bill 1807. It does add a small amount of time. It adds about 10% onto what uh, non-custodial parents are getting. I already have that right now. So my custody order is around 33%. Now, most health professionals will tell you that a single parent home, uh, the cutoff is around 35%. That's a, that's a statement that most uh, psychiatrists and, uh, agree with in health, uh, mental health professionals. Um, what we're seeing right now, and I've, look, I've, I've got some experience. I am actually a, a, a pastor, um, so I can identify with uh, Representative Sanford on seeing youth and seeing how children are being affected right now in single parent homes, and it's, it's hurting them. Um, 63% of suicides, uh, all these behavioral issues. It's at 20 times the rate on average. Um, I don't know how many of you know that the Santa Fe shooter came from a father's fatherless home. There was times where the Santa Fe shooter did not see his father for six months. Um, that's been a re reoccurring theme. 26 of the last 28 mass shooters came from a fatherless or father-deprived home. I'll end with this illustration. Um, think about a pie. When I was a kid, uh, sometimes we had leftover pie, and in the evening we had to split that up. To reduce the conflict uh, between me and my brothers, my parents would have one of us dissect that pie, and the other two brothers got to pick which pieces. So the person dissecting the pie was very careful to slice it in half and make a fair, equal portion. How many parents would be willing to do that with the custody orders that they have received? Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Jaros? If not, thank you, sir. 14. My name is Hunter Youngblood. Um, I'm here. I represent myself, Americans for Parental Quality, 
but most of all, I represent my three daughters, Sophia, Lucy, and Lily Youngblood. Okay, and you are for I am for the bill. Okay, thank you, sir. <clears throat> so you just go ahead with the testimony now. In 2015, I walked into family court uh, thinking that we would be treated fairly and have really due process. This couldn't be further from the truth. At temporary orders, I was uh, awarded standard possession order. And what I have done is I've kind of mapped out what standard possession order is for you and how many days I went to the calendar last year because there's been a lot of misconception of really what it is. And reality is it's 88 overnight days. So I was, I was limited to standard possession order. But I want to make it a commitment right here. I want you to look. My oldest daughter here, which I adopted, uh, which I was given a stood in front of a judge to give 100% custody and now the courts tell me I have 24% of the time it's a disgrace and we should allow fathers and mothers to have equal time with their children I have never run from responsibility how can they tell me when I have adopted a child at 100% that now I'm going back to 24% it does not make any sense as you can see, lastly, too, I put a ruling, my court ruling. I spent over $225,000 to be in 50-50 custody. I would like to tell you, I do, I do have 50-50 custody now, at a very high price. All of my children's 529 plans have went to attorneys. Uh, they have wiped it clean, but I will say I prevailed. It took 24 months. And I was awarded 50-50. I've never committed a crime, served in the military. I've done everything the way it's supposed to be done. It's about time that we make a change for the kids of Texas. And uh, lastly, what I did is I submitted, this is from the Attorney General Handbook. And I just highlighted where you said, it says, many people think only fathers can be non-custodial parents, but that's not the case. In Texas, about 10% of non-custodial parents are mothers. This, this right here is gender bias and it is discrimination. Thank you. Mr. Youngblood, thank you so much for coming. <coughs> Any questions from Mr. Youngblood? Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, George Saldana. Oh, if you'd give us your name and who you represent uh, and you're registered for HB 2157 position on that bill. George Saldana, uh, House Bill 3414 uh, and 2157. Thank you um, for letting me come up here and testify. Um, okay. The Texas Constitution Bill of Rights says equality. In a world where we live in uh, everybody wants to be equal, all we're trying to do is be equal. We have a whole bunch of parents here that are here on their own dime. They're not lobbyists. They're not being paid to be here. All we're trying to do is be a parent to our, our children. The Attorney General does just said, like Mr. Hunt uh, Youngblood said, that uh, only 10% of non-custodial are women. I got on the father, father's rights movement train because I felt like I was being discriminated against. But since then, I've met a bunch of women that are going through the same thing. The Family Code says it should assure children will have frequent and continuing contact with parents who have shown the ability to act in the best interest of the child. James White asked for an opinion from the Attorney General here just recently. February 22nd of this year, the Attorney General came down with what our constitutional rights and our state rights are. This is from the state of Texas, from the Attorney General that we have now. The uh, District Attorneys Association also says, our primary goal is to make sure that the children get to see and interact with both parents in every situation that is appropriate. Texas Attorney District Attorneys Association. One of the big things that's, that's, that baffles me is that right down the road on Red River, we have uh, Dr. Cynthia Osborne. Dr. Cynthia Osborne has become a key, peop is one of the key people whom the state of Texas turns to when it wants a rigorous evaluation of its child protection and pre prevention programs. The state of Texas, our Attorney General funds her research the state of Texas funds her research. Her research is online. She has 34 pages of her resume. And here, as school district, uh, ex-school district, 39% more likely to mostly A's in schools, 45% less likely to repeat a grade. 
and 80% less likely to spend in jail. All her research is online. Okay, sir. We uh, we do greatly appreciate if, it. Thank one you more again. thing. One more thing. One more thing. Accessibility was on one of her research um, papers for father involvement. We're all here. We're all asking for accessibility. Please vote on this tonight. Let's make it happen. Okay. Any questions? Members? Okay. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, chair calls Orlando Marquez. All right, it's Orlando Marquez, and I'm 4 HB 2157. I've worked in uniform for over 25 years. I've worked in municipal law enforcement, and I'm currently a security contractor for our federal government. I know the damaging effects uh, of fathers' homes. I'm here to support 2157, which preserves a child's equal access to both fit, willing, and able parents after separation and divorce. Now, Quality in Texas has always been complicated, but we've always embraced those complications. We realize that the worst source of complication is perpetual inequality. We have reached a point in our society that has established women are equal to men, but those within the law enforcement community are starting to question why men are not considered equal to women. Now, you're going to hear the opposition comments, and they're going to state that 50-50 uh, time sharing is what we already have, but according to a Travis County judge, James Arth, the family code does not think 50-50 time sharing is a good idea. Now, this is an individual. This is a judge's interpretation of the law, which is going to supersede the, op the opposition's interpretation of the law. So I urge the committee to vote today in order to advance House Bill 2157. Thank okay. you. Okay. Any questions for Mr. Marquez? Thank you, sir, for being here. Thank you. Okay. Craig Haston. Please state your name, who you represent, and your position. Looks like you're on HB 2157 and HB 3414. Yes, sir, and I'm here. To, uh, my name is Craig Haston. I'm here on behalf of the Texas Family Law Foundation, and we oppose 3414 and 2157, but I'm specifically here to talk about 3414. Uh, uh, members, um, I am also a parent. I have two uh, young grown children, grown, grown children. I appreciate what everybody's had to say here, but what we keep forgetting about all these groups that are fathers for equal father rights and equal parent rights, they quit. They keep forgetting about what's important, which is what's important to the, is the children's rights. And they put their rights in to the mouths of the children. Uh, studies have shown, and for the last 25 to 30 years, I've been practicing 26 and a half years in family law, I've watched us go from a standard possession order where men had almost no rights and couldn't make any decisions and women can move anywhere they wanted predominantly and we have worked to give men and women more equal rights over time getting to the standard possession order that we have today this standard possession order that we have today I've heard numbers between 20 percent and 43 percent and 35 percent they're all over the board but if we look at the standard possession order we have Monday Tuesday and Wednesday of each week fathers get extra time in the summer uh, not fathers but the other parent the visiting parent but predominantly we have the best interest of the child at heart in these cases. The courts have to look at that. And the standard position order, by the way, is the minimum amount of time that a court can give to somebody in a visitation schedule. The courts can deviate if they want from the standard possession order. They're allowed to go to a 50-50 if they think that's in the best interest of the children. But this presumes that these people are reasonable and communicative people. They, however, they wouldn't be in front of judges. They would have been part of the 95% of the other people that settle their cases, many of whom settle on 50-50. But when they come before a court, a court has to make that decision. And they can't give them 50-50 most of the time, and there's a good reason for that. This statute has many, many, many problems, one of which shifts the burden of proof to the other parent, one of which sets out a possession schedule for a 225, which leaves the children in limbo, never knowing where they're going to be from one week to the next, because they don't know whether they're going to be somewhere on Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, Thursday. They don't know any of that. The standard possession order only is only off by one day per week in general. Uh, I guess that's my time. We're opposed to it, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Mr. Haston? Uh, Ms. Klein, did you have a question? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we're looking at the, the 2019 standard possession order, and it's yes. 200, I believe, 84 overnights for the primary and mm -hmm. 89 for the, for the, the secondary. Well, I didn't have any time to do any quick numbers on that. I was trying to listen to the gentleman that said that he had 80, 80 overnights, but if there's 52 weeks in the year and if a father or if a visiting parent gets 
first, third, and fifth weekends out of 52 weekends. Half of that plus a few is going to be about 80 overnights by themselves, not counting the Friday nights that they also get, which would add to that, and not counting the 30 days in the summer that they additionally get. Uh, and also not counting the, the Thanksgiving, the spring, break, the spring break period, and the half of the Christmas period that they get, which are all equal periods of time for the parents. So well, uh, every other year, though. Pardon me? It's every other year. And for for, I, looked at, I looked at the schedule. Mm -hmm. So And even if you did the summers where you did two weeks on, two weeks off, it still equates to 89 versus 284. And so if okay. you are given joint custody, I don't see how you can put that two together and say that that's equal. Well, I believe we have somebody else who can answer some of your questions on that. I haven't done the math on the, on the overnight numbers, uh, but I, I look at it from a, I look at it to see what, where we are equal and where we're not equal. Mm -hmm. uh, we're fairly equal on the weekends. Essentially, it's every other weekend for parents. Right, but during the week, they don't have any access. That's Thir not Every equal. Thursday night. Every Thursday wow, night. Wow, a Thursday? <laughs> yes. Well, that which leaves Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. If you move one day, then you're to 50%. Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, the other mm -hmm. parent gets, and the other parent gets 135. Mm -hmm. So, or no, two four, right? Uh, they get two four. So primary yes. gets two four, yes. and every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and the secondary gets one three five and Thursdays. Thursdays, that's, yes. That's, that's right. not equal, and that's not in the best interest of the child. Well, no, it's a standard possession order. Nobody that said was, that was that was put into law in 1995. Well, we've been amending it since then to give additional overnights, which is the thir pick up from school after school on Thursdays and return to school Monday mornings, which gives uh, overnight on uh, Sunday nights. I just don't understand why anybody would want to be against this when it gives parents actual equal access to their children and it puts it in the code to where that could actually be given. Because well, when you go to court, mm -hmm. if one parent can't afford to pay, then they're going to have to sign off to agreements that they may not want to. And then that child is going to suffer. Well, it's all, it's not for me. I'm not a doctor. I'm not here to say who's right and who's wrong. Well, about we just did hear from the child expert doctor. We, we heard one, we heard one doctor, but there's been many studies that have led to the standard possession order that we have today that have said that it, this is what's in the best interest of the child. And, and this legislature, not this particular legislature, but this government has said that the standard possession order we have now is in the best interest of the child. And that's what we support. The way these, these bills are drafted, they're not effective and they won't, they won't lead to less litigation. They'll lead to more litigation. And the way they're drafted, actually, they're I'm going to have to interrupt you there real quick. Um, okay. I don't think that's the case mm -hmm. because when you get divorced, you go and you fight over, like you get the house, you get the car, and then once that's settled, they're done fighting over the possessions. You cannot go back and fight over your house and your retirement again. That's settled. But what you can continuously go back to court and fight about are your children. So if you already given equal access to your children when the, from the point when you get divorced, then why would you continue to fight? Well, because a lot of people don't believe that equal access to the children is in the best interest of the children. If you come from a county such as mine, Harris County, which is a very huge county, and you have parents living on one, one side of the county or on the other side of the county, or if you do what is pre predominantly done, which is the courts grant Harris County and contiguous counties, mm -hmm. you can end up tra traipsing your kids all over town, sitting in the car for two hours per trip, which isn't fair to the children. We're not I, focusing on the children, I, we're focusing on the I agree with you parents. with that, but that's actually something that can be remedied as well, because you can say, hey, guess what? We live here in this school district, and so we're going to stay in the school district until the child graduates. That's a great idea, Representative, and we put that in our media settlement agreements all the time when people agree. But right now, we don't have any statute that says that courts shall restrict the periods if they're going to do that. This, neither of these bills Right, do. but that's something that could be decided as well but that could be mediated but we're talking about right now we're talking about access to the children and i think when you have two parents that are fit parents to limit their amount of time is really unfair to the child well i, I appreciate your i appreciate that um, i'm not sure how to respond to it but i appreciate your statement okay Thanks. okay anybody else thank you sir chair recognize uh, representative sanford to close on hb 3414. thank you uh multiple chairs. I think we've had three tonight. It's called rotating chair. <laughs> Indeed. Thank you for your time and staying up uh, late. And thank you for all of those who came to testify tonight. We really appreciate you traveling to the Capitol, taking uh, time out of your work and uh, uh, personal life to, to be here. Uh, I do think that in 
addition to gratitude, we also, uh, I, I think they're doing an apology as well because of the testimony of Mr. Haston, I believe it was, from Houston, who uh, uh, somehow found a way to disparage an entire group of people, all of those who ended up uh, on the losing end of this uh, battle, so, so to speak. He uh, seemed to call them non-communicative, non and then he doubled down and basically just said that uh, there, were, uh, there were reasons uh, why they didn't uh, win their, their uh, battle as well. Um, and then, uh, thank you for the questions to him, Representative Kalani, because uh, it is obvious he could do math, he just didn't want to do the math uh, that uh, you thankfully had done and, uh, and so thank you for, for those questions uh, so again uh, thank you for your time this evening and thank you for those who, ca who came to testify and uh, with that I close okay any additional questions if not uh, HB 3414 will be left pending at this time thank you chairman Joshua Jettles Good evening again, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. This this was a bill actually that was brought because of an incident that uh, I had with my children at their school. Um, I am for this bill. I am representing uh, myself and uh, Montgomery County United for Shared Parenting. And there's probably not a question that I can't answer about this. I've gone through the grievance process at Conroe ISD. So I would encourage you, if you have questions about this, I definitely do want to answer those questions uh, before I leave the podium. Most schools are looking at uh, these, these court orders and it'll say school activities as it's written in the Texas Family Code. So that means that I can go and I, I go to field trips already. I go to, uh, uh, we had, a, for instance, a Thanksgiving feast this, uh, this last Thanksgiving and I went into there with that. Um, and all parents that have, uh, um, joint uh, conservatorship, which would be a standard or a uh, expanded possession order, can go in any time school is in session. But what's going on is a small amount of schools across Texas are, are calling lunch as not being a school activity. Now, I'm just as confounded as everybody else is why that would be. Um, but there's, and, and even the, the school attorneys are saying that it's an activity, but they're saying it's an activity that the legislature never intended non-custodial parents to attend. And I, I, I don't think that's anywhere true. Um, well, they know that. <laughs> so, so here we are, we've got, and, and the school brought up a couple questions. What about mom and dad when they come together? Well, that's already occurring. Uh, how do we know that non-custodials are, one, one uh, school board member said, how do we know that these non-custodial parents are safe? Well, we're already showing up at school for all of these events. I'll close with this real quick. Uh, another school district next to us in, in our county recently changed their position. Uh, and a divorce attorney said, hey, you can't be allowing non-custodials to have lunch. And we found out that the reason was because parents, th this administrator communi communicated to me that it was because parents just wanted to spend more time with their children and that they were using this as a loophole. And I think that's a great thing. If we can get parents to spend more time with their kids and if they're using this opportunity, it's great for parents and great for kids. All right, Mr. Jarvis, thank you thank very you. much for being here. Thanks. Any questions? Not hearing any. Uh, chair calls Deborah Nams. I don't think she's present and uh, she will be shown as not testifying but in favor of the bill. Uh, the chair calls Michael Clifton. Clifton, thank you for your patience. Thank you, Chairman. I have a few handouts here. I'll try to be short and sweet as we're wrapping up here. Uh, good evening, Chairman and members of the committee. We heard some earlier testimony. I want to draw some parallels. Um, very passionate arguments on both sides, for example, on an earlier bill, House Bill 2109, not to be advanced by this body due to the potential for discriminatory practices. So conversely, I would expect this same protection by this body to correct a discriminatory, discriminatory practice against a segment of our population, that being non-custodial parents who are predominantly fathers just trying to have lunch with their children. On the handout, I'd like to draw to your attention to a few arguments that we found in support of Mr. Jaros's position, both federal and state level, uh, either laws and or policies. Again, I, I'm going to parrot Mr. Jaros here. I find it absurd that this school has taken this arbitrary position. 
uh, I direct your attention to Roman number one. The child, uh, how are cases of joint custody treated? The child will receive free meals regardless of which parent had custody at the time. The child's going to be fed, but why should the child be placed in the position of not having mom and or dad there at a lunchtime visit? Furthermore, the same U.S. Department of Agriculture, which is a federal agency, uh, actively encourages parents to become involved in their children's school meals and to bring concerns and suggestions to the attention of local officials. How can the parents do that if they're precluded from even attending? Furthermore, the, the USDA recommends that parents eat breakfast or lunch at school with your children. So there's a myriad, again, of policies here in effect by both federal and state elements that I would draw your attention to in support of having parental involvement in that lunchtime. Uh, Representative Kalani earlier uh, stated that state employees should be serving everybody the same and not discriminate. I would direct your attention to Roman numeral six in this handout, which specifically under the US Department of Education relative to a civil rights violation, where the red arrow is on parental status. That's exactly what this school's arbitrary decision is doing to this parent and more. So I would urge you to pass this legislation and I All do right. fully support it. Mr. Clifton, thank you for being here and certainly thank you for your patience. Thank you all. Any questions, members, for Mr. Clifton? Not hearing any, thank you very much. Uh, the chair at this time calls Stuart McMullen. Howdy, Chairman and committee members. My name is Stuart McMullen. I'm with Americans for Parental Equality, and I'm testifying for House Bill 3145. Currently, I participate in the watchdog program at my son's school in Leander ISD, and I also run the program for his campus. In addition, I volunteer as a member on the PTO board and help out wherever they need assistance. And in fact, just yesterday, I chaperoned a field trip to the Bob Bullock Museum in short, I've spent a lot of time at the school volunteering and interacting with the teachers and the staff and the students over the past five years. There's a common theme that I always hear, and that's that the teachers and staff are always uh, begging for more parental involvement. And they always thank me for my time, and they are very appreciative that I'm involved in my son's education. However, not every parent has the luxury of working from home to be able to contribute their time to these volunteer opportunities. But when they do get a day off here and there, they should be able to, at the minimum, have lunch with their children at school. Some school districts in Texas, Conroe ISD is one of them, do not consider lunch as a school activity. They also have a policy that if a parent does not have possession of their child that day, then that parent is not allowed to have lunch with their children. Under the standard possession order, which the state thinks is in the best interest of the child, one parent will never have possession of their child during school hours because their possession always begins at 6 o'clock on Thursdays and Fridays and ends on that Sunday at 6 o'clock. Under the expanded standard possession order, one parent will never have possession of their children during school hours because their possession always begins when school is dismissed and always ends when school begins. So technically with this policy, one parent will never be able to have lunch with their children. This is absurd. I know my time is running out, so I'll close. My son, to, the, to this day, he's in fourth grade. When he sees me in the cafeteria, he still runs to me and jumps in my arms. The excitement in his spirit and the soul, and in, in his soul is contagious. And I see that same sparkle in the other kids' eyes when, they, when their parents show up. Kids need these, this time with their parents. Kids crave this time with their parents. And by the way, the parents also need this policy. I'm fortunate that Leander ISD does not have the same policy as Conroe ISD because I am able to have lunch with him anytime I want. And there are many benefits for this. Uh, this seems like a common sense bill. Please vote for this bill. All right, Mr. McMullen, thank you for being here. Thank you for your testimony and patience. Any questions of Mr. McMullen members? Not hearing any, thank you. Not hearing any, the chair recognized representative talk to close. I am 58 years old. I'm an old dad. My kids are all grown up. And when I was a young dad, I was not intentional enough to my shame to have lunch with my kids as often as I should have. And at one time or another, I had to say to them all when they're in their late 20s, 
You deserved a dad that spent more time with you when you were a kid, that was more intentional with you, that lived in the moment. My dad's 93 at 90, he said, Steve, live in the moment. I'm like, Dad, where were you when I was 20? You should have told me that. <laughs> and um, these are parents that are trying to live in the moment, that are trying to be there for their kids. And I hope that you'll make every opportunity to help them do that and ask for a favorable vote out of this committee as soon as possible. Thank right. you so much. I know it's right. late, and I appreciate you guys hanging in there with us. Thank, thank you, Representative Toth. Uh, it's the chair's intent to leave House Bill 3145 as a matter of pending business before the full committee without objection. The chair uh, will do so.